Big East Showdown. Now, Sports Center with Greg Gumbel and George Grant. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the ESPN Sports Center. Uh, as you saw there, Chris Berman will be joining us in just a few minutes. He is fresh off the Silver Bird from Miami, where he covered the Dolphins and the Steelers. And talking and looking ahead to the Super Bowl, George, with all due respects to and regrets to the fans of the Bears and the Steelers, I guess it's only right that the two best teams in football all season long should meet for the championship. We saw two pretty impressive performances yesterday, didn't we? He did indeed. You know, when you look at uh, the way things developed after just uh, what seemed to be an eternity from a couple of years ago when Bill Walsh was having his difficulties and one day after qualifying for his second trip to the Super Bowl, Bill Walsh has announced that he will return to the San Francisco 49ers for the next two years as their head football coach. It's a far cry from three years ago when Walsh was thinking of quitting after a three and six strike shortened season. Since then, he has, of course, won three divisional titles in the last four years and heads into the Super Bowl with a 6-1 and one postseason record all told. The announcement by the Niners and Walsh comes less than a day after his team shut out a pretty good Chicago Bear club to make it to the Super Bowl two Sundays from this week. The announcement by the Niners, of course, was big news for San Francisco, but not as big as the news that came yesterday with the victory over the Bears. Greg Wyatt has more for SportsCenter. The battle to decide the NFC Super Bowl representative was just that. Friday, both coaches felt the game would be a low-scoring one. For 30 minutes, they were right. Chicago, not San Francisco, started like a dynamo with Walter Payton running wild after the opening kickoff, setting up a 41-yard field goal for Bob Thomas. But he broke his streak of 12 straight three-pointers missing wide right, and that was as close as they'd get all day. 49er mistakes, not the Bears' sack pack, kept the game close. This Joe Montana fumble cost the Niners a TD. The San Franciscans had to settle for a three-pointer. Chicago free safety Gary Fensick got his first of two interceptions a short time later, hijacking an underthrown TD attempt by Montana. And the first quarter ended 3-0. The Niners' defense then stole the show in the second quarter, recording three sacks. I think uh, our defense all week we felt like Rodney Dangerfield. You know, we didn't get no respect. And, you know, hopefully we can keep being overlooked, you know, let them keep looking for the offensive battles, you know, and maybe we can keep slipping up on people. They just totally shut us down. Uh, everything we did didn't work. Basically got our ass kicked is what happened, and my hat's off to them. We didn't uh, establish any sort of running game whatsoever, which is what we were trying to do so we could then go off and do some play-action passes maybe, but uh, they came to play, and we didn't, and the best team won, and I wish them all the luck in Super Bowl. Wendell Tyler's nine-yard touchdown run in the third quarter ignited the 49ers on both sides of the ball. The players realized a shutout of the Chicagoans was imminent. I really wasn't concerned about our first half because uh, really we were stopping ourselves and uh, you know, they weren't stopping us. Uh, I knew we could come out and play our kind of ball we could play or we would win. You know, and, uh, it took a running game to get the momentum going. For San Diego Charger cast off Gary Johnson, the NFC Championship win was especially sweet. Big Hands got two of the 49ers' nine sacks. Man, I feel good inside. You know, like, oh, this is like a taste of honey. And I've been waiting on this for a long time. I can't get outside, wait to get outside and hug and kiss my wife. You know, like, we've been waiting on this a long time. We didn't have our best game of the year, you can tell, but you can't take any way, anything away from them. They're a very good defense, so I'm sure they'll go on and do, do very well in the Super Bowl, too. The NFC Championship game proved to be a horror show for the Monsters of the Midway as the San Francisco 49ers barely have to leave the city limits to host Super Bowl XIX in that much ballyhooed matchup with the Miami Dolphins. Greg Wyatt, ESPN San Francisco. Thanks, Greg. This is what you witnessed yesterday. Air Montana, San Francisco led by quarterback Joe Montana against what was the overall number one defense in the National Football League. Montana was 18 of 34 for 233 yards and two interceptions. Give him credit, yes, but give Bill Walsh the credit for designing the offense that you could plug someone in and do a great job. He has the perfect man that he's plugged in with the fast feet, the quick hands, and the perfect delivery. Joe Montana had a great afternoon. But the defense, probably the biggest story internally of this team, because they know they're good and they proved it yesterday. Nine sacks for over uh, 48 yards, close to 50 yards worth of lost yardage. Net passing only 37 yards for the Bears. Net rushing 149 yards. Total yards 186. 49er defense, of course, in the last uh, two games plus has been nearly impregnable. The San Francisco 49ers exceptionally defensively as well as offensively yesterday, Greg. 
And now for the next two weeks, we will hear the comparisons between the 49ers and the Miami Dolphins. Our Chris Berman is just back from Miami. He covered the Miami-Pittsburgh game yesterday and was about the only defensive back that Dan Marino didn't beat. I believe your area was the locker room uh, near the showers, and, and nobody got by you yesterday. I hid behind the goalpost. I figure I was safe. There was a clinic yesterday, and I, it was a lot of fun to be at that game, except, of course, if you were a Steeler, I guess, Greg. You can watch years and years of playoff games and never see a performance like the one Dan Marino and the Miami Dolphins put on yesterday in the Orange Bowl. Whatever the resourceful Pittsburgh Steelers came up with on defense had no effect whatsoever on the Dolphin juggernaut. The facts speak for themselves. No team has ever thrown for more yards in a playoff game than Miami's 435, and Dan Marino's 421 yards passing has been bettered only once in the postseason. That was three years ago when Dan Fouts had to work overtime in that memorable playoff game when the Chargers beat the Dolphins. Every time you think you've seen Marino at his best, he comes back with a better performance. And if he plants the top yesterday's four TD pass showing in the Super Bowl, then Palo Alto may experience an earthquake the likes of which they have never experienced before. Reno deserves all the laurels he received last night and today, but if truth be known, the Pittsburgh Steelers didn't exactly lay down on the job either, certainly not on offense. One of the richest rivalries in football was renewed Sunday, and to be honest, it was refreshing to see a big-time Dolphins-Steelers game again. Pittsburgh knew everything had to go their way to win, and they pulled out all the stops by reactivating Jack Lambert in search of a spiritual lift. They said they'd run the football plain and simple, and they did so early. Rich Ehrenberg's seven-yard TD blast up the middle tied the game at seven in the first quarter. They were moving the ball, and no wonder. Watch again as center Mike Webster, number 52, blows fellow All-Pro performer Bob Baumauer toward the goalpost as the rookie back surges into the end zone. The Steelers averaged four and a half yards a clip, a nice figure considering there was no mystery to their tactics. We played good, but uh, I think we could play a lot better. You know, we they ran the ball at us pretty good the first first half, um, and uh, then they made like the big plays. Like I said, with Solworth had a couple good play, great catches, and then uh, you know the last touchdown at the end of the game. But uh, you know, we just can't can't give those things to them. We out physical them, we out manned them, uh, especially in the first half. We were just coming off the ball and, and kicking their tails. Uh, but like I say, uh, there were a couple very crucial mistakes that uh, really cost us uh, the football game. Malone also had a 300-yard day throwing the ball, and the Steelers did score 28 points, enough to win on most occasions. Before the Miami offense made the outcome obvious, Pittsburgh was done in by three major penalties. This completion of John Stallworth inside Miami's 20 in the game's first drive was negated by his offensive pass interference. The next play was a William Judson interception. At 7-7 early in the second quarter, a run to the Miami 9 by Walter Abercrombie was nixed by a holding penalty way behind the play. The end result was a missed 53-yard field goal by Gary Anderson. The killer came with a minute and a half left in the half on the first play after the Dolphins regained the lead at 17-14. Pittsburgh was looking for points, and Frank Pollard started the drive with an 11-yard run out of bounds to kill the clock on his own 35. Holding called that back as well, forcing Malone to press his luck for points. He waited a tad too long looking for Stallworth, and Lyle Blackwood picked him clean. Miami turned this into a 10-point halftime lead, and the blitzkrieg was only in second gear. Now we get to the easy part. What Marino did to the Steelers was downright scary and cruel. In short, he shredded one of the best defenses in football. Virtually every pass was on the mark, and even when Pittsburgh sent eight men in on a blitz, he was rarely pressured. So much of it is his release, and of course his receiver core is tops. But give a huge pat on the back to an offensive line that has improved on its less than a sack a game stats in the regular season. Two playoff wins, no sacks. It's easy to grade their performance. 45 points, <laughs> no sacks. I think pretty good. A plus. A. All right. <laughs> we can always improve. Dan is so quick with the gun that, that he sees it and still manages to get the ball off. So it's been that combination that's been working for us all year long. The fact that our offensive line knows what they're doing, what their responsibilities are. Our backs that are back there picking up blitzers do a good job. And Reno sees the blitz and knows that he has to uh, get rid of the ball and does a great job. 
they uh, are pressure defense, and they try to come after us and uh, make things happen. And, and, and the problem with pressure defense is anytime you blitz and you don't get there, there's an opportunity to get burnt for the big one. And uh, that's what happened today. You know, we put them in a situation where they had to try and take the ball away from us, so they came after us. And every time they came after us, uh, the offensive line picked the blitz up, and the receivers were able to get it open, and uh, Danny put the ball on the money. 45 points against one of the best defenses in football. What does that say? Well, they're not going against the worst offensive unit in the <laughs> NFL. So they have to respect us, too, for being one of the, the best in the NFL. Also in the post-game uh, post uh, festivities in the Miami locker room, I asked Bob Brzezinski what he would do if he had to stop the Dolphin offense. He laughed, said one word, pray. Yesterday's game had more than 1,000 yards in total offense, which boggles the mind coming in a contest as important as an AFC championship game. Let me reiterate what we said last night. At halftime, the outcome was very much in doubt, but before the third quarter was over, you knew it was the Dolphins, and it was the Dolphins big. I can't remember a team playing as well as Pittsburgh was, uh, was getting systematically rubbed out the way they were, but then again, I can't remember too many offensive performances like the one Miami put on yesterday. And oh, by the way, in case the 49ers are saying, great, Clayton's hurt because he didn't play in the second half. They looked at his shoulder today. He's fine. He'll be back in practice Wednesday. They'll be going full throttle at San Francisco. Should be. They always look, you know, the games that look great on paper always turn out to be duds. But if this one isn't great, I, I don't, I'd be very surprised. They were worried about Clayton, no doubt, uh, last night. But the news today was good news. You know, the thing that, that yes, the Pittsburgh Steelers have lost, but you've got to be impressed with the way they put together this season and the job that Chuck Noll has done from top to bottom yep. with that club. You know, Noll would never say it that this was his best coaching job ever because he's that not he's not that type of person but it is uh, he just had a few veterans that instilled little confidence in the younger guys and malone came a long way and now they know who the quarterback's going to be next year woodley again is going to have to get aced out malone came this far in half a season they have to go with him things are looking up for the steelers they played well yesterday they just ran into a, a maelstrom you know it's one other thing too you mentioned what marino did was scary and cruel and yet all week long we heard about the chicago bear defense and very little about the 49er right. defense the fact that the 49ers excelled on the defensive side of the field so much i have to feel that that more than anything else is why san francisco is favored by two and a half at this stage of the game i would think so they made a big statement by saying look a shutout i mean what more of a statement can you make they have an excellent offense and excellent defense miami's defense fair they think they can play better they think they can do it in palo alto Good job on the road, Chris. Thank the you, same, Rich. of course, for Greg Wyatt, who uh, was out covering the game in San Francisco. Early line, San Francisco, a two-and-a-half-point pick over the Miami Dolphins in the Super Bowl, coming up not this Sunday, but the Sunday thereafter. Still a whole lot more to come on this ESPN Sports Center. We'll be taking a look at College Basketball Report with Bob Lee and Dick Vitale right after the Sports Center. Don't forget, we've got live college basketball, Big East version coming up. Next up, baseball news with the announcement of the 85 Hall of Fame electees set for later tonight. Every week, one publication, only one, shows you hundreds of the best jobs open all across the country. From every regional edition of the Wall Street Journal, jobs in every field, in top companies at $25,000 a year, up to a quarter of a million. This is the one, the National Business Employment Weekly. Every week, one publication, only one, also gives you authoritative articles that can help you land those jobs. Expert articles on effective resume writing, what to expect at interviews, current salary levels, new career opportunities. This is the one, the National Business Employment Weekly. If you want to find out about a great job that's open right now, if you want help in landing it right now, this, this is, is the, the one, one, the only one. one. Ask for the National Business Employment Weekly at your newsstand. Or if you prefer, you can have the next eight issues sent by first class mail for $32. Just call toll free 800-372-3000. That's eight weekly issues, $32. Call 800-372-3000 now. Monday, ESPN's College Basketball Report makes its season premiere with highlights from around the country and hoop scoops from Bob and Dick. Next, Chris Mullen and St. John's run and gun with Villanova in a live Big East basketball flash. The Redmen are rolling toward a super season. The PKA World Super Heavyweight Championship follows from Florida. Anthony Elmore and Tony Palmore make the title fight mean more. Kickboxing and basketball make our Monday. 
Some news out of Major League Baseball. All sides confirmed today what had been the weekend rumor, the acquisition of Kansas City Royals infielder UL Washington by the Montreal Expos. 31-year-old Washington has spent all seven of his Major League seasons with the Royals. His career batting average of 254 is 30 points better than what he hit last season. He's expected to back up Hubie Brooks at shortstop in Montreal, the Expos giving up two minor leaguers in the deal. Meanwhile, Detroit Tigers Cy Young Award winner and MVP Willie Hernandez says he's ready to sign a four-year, $4.5 million offer from the world champs if Detroit will defer some of it and if the team will guarantee increases, which will keep his salary at least equal to any of the other Tiger pitchers. Less than four hours from now, we will know what player or players has been elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame by the Baseball Writers Association of America. The ballots are in. The word will be released at 11 o'clock Eastern Time this evening, and a news conference is set for tomorrow morning in New York City. Three of the key candidates, those that are likely and having the best opportunity to get in this year, start with Hoyt Wilhelm, career leader in games pitch with 1,070, 21-year major league career. He was 15-3 for the 52 Giants, also led the league that year with 71 appearances and a 2.43 ERA, led the AL with a 2.19 ERA in 59. And how about Broccoli? Lou Brock, the outfielder from the Cubs and the Cardinals, played 19 Major League seasons, 15 with the Cards, 65-79, to 2,900 career hits, career 292 batting average, but of course the big number is 938, 938 stolen bases, the all-time stolen base leader. And of course, there's Nellie Fox, the deceased second baseman. He played 19 Major League seasons, all but three with the White Sox. Over 2,600 hits, scored 100 or more runs four times, batted 300 or more six times, led the American League in hits four times, did miss a game between 53 and 59. Nellie Fox is regarded as a long shot to get into the Hall of Fame. Jim Bunning, Mickey Lolich, Catfish Hunter also eligible. The announcement at 11 o'clock Eastern time tonight, and then the news conference will be in New York City tomorrow, Greg. His double play partner, Louis Aparicio, was inducted last time. It'd be nice if Nelly could make it this time Louis around. Louis said it last year in Cooperstown, too. He said, I wish I was going in with Nelly. We shall see. A change of heart has West Virginia basketball fans smiling. College hoop and NBA highlights when the Sports Center continues in a moment. Last year, car makers spent a record $1 billion in advertising just to tell you how wonderful their cars are. Fortunately, there's a more objective opinion, car owners. According to a recent survey, of all cars in America, import or domestic, Subaru ranks second only to Mercedes in customer satisfaction. And that's the kind of advertising money can't buy. In Austin, visit Roger Beasley Subaru at 8501 Research. Let you and me watch a movie, get cuddly. We'll bring along the cookie jar. Won't tell anybody where we are. There's no place like HBO. We'll make your spirit shine, your evenings glow. What a feeling! Oh, what a show! There's no place like HBO. All the action in the NBA was out west last night, and lately the Utah Jazz seem to be making the right moves. Two nights ago they beat Denver, last night they beat the other big gun in the Midwest Division, the Houston Rockets. Portland got on the right track against the Indiana Pacers, and the Lakers' Kareem Abdul-Jabbar beat San Antonio at the buzzer in Los Angeles last night. We'll pick it up in the fourth quarter. Artist Gilmore steals a page from the Jabbar book with the sky hook, 23 points. Score was tied at 90 when Johnny Moore drove and hit on the shot. And the Spurs led by two, 92-90. Time winding down, James Worthy to Michael Cooper to Kareem. The turnaround at the buzzer is good. Los Angeles, a winner, 99-98. Pat Riley is happy. Kareem is happy. The cheerleaders are doing high pom-poms on the sideline. Take a look again, and you will see the 37-year-old, 16-year veteran. His 28 points on the night, the last two, the big ones on the turnaround. L.A. wins its ninth straight, 99-98. to Meanwhile, in Portland, on the fast break, Indiana's Vern Fleming, the rookie, scores. He led the team with 22 points, but a big blazer third quarter just buried the Pacers. Clyde Drexler feeds Kiki Vandeweghe. Five Blazers in double-figure scoring last night. Vandaway, 12 in the quarter. The long jumper there. He led all scorers with 26. And Devin Durant with the rebound coming up. But watch Jimmy Paxson, number four, reach in, slam it loose. Darnell Valentine to Sam Bowie to Drexler. 
and Portland coasted from there, 118 to 101. Salt Lake City, a balanced attack for Utah. Six players in double figures led by Adrian Dantley, 28. And a good game for Akeem Olajuwon for Houston. Watch number 34 with the rebound, 29 points, 18 rebounds in all for Akeem. Not to be outdone, though, what other big man in basketball can do this? Coast to coast, and in for the jam, 19 points in all for Ralph. It's a good defense by the Jazz, though. Mark Eaton, one of his seven block shots on the night. Daryl Griffith get two of his 23. The Jazz went on to win it by a score of 121 to 92. And the slate in the NBA looks like this tonight. Philadelphia looking to make up ground on Boston. They trail by a half game. The Celtics are at New York to play the Knicks. Golden State at Kansas City. The Clippers will host Utah, and Seattle will play host to the Dallas Mavericks. Atlantic 10 Commissioner Charlie Theokas had his first major decision as the new top man for the league today, and the result is West Virginia is a winner in basketball and St. Joe's is a loser in that disputed game from this past weekend. To refresh your memory just a bit, it first seemed like West Virginia won when Lester Rowe jammed in a rebound of a desperation shot at the buzzer, giving West Virginia a lead and uh, apparently a win 51-50. to but the officials of the game, some five minutes after the game had ended, decided that the clock had expired and the basket, in fact, did not count. Theokas ruled today that according to the NCAA rule book, the ref's decision on the court is the one that counts and not anything they do after the game because their jurisdiction ends when the game is concluded. Let's refresh your memory a bit and take a look at it once again. Three seconds left, 50-49, St. Joe's ahead. Now, WVU forward Lester Rowe will stuff the ball at the final buzzer. Listen for the buzzer. They thought they won, but nearly 10 minutes after the game ended, the chief game official had indicated that the basket could not be allowed because the basket came after the expired gun. But League Commissioner Theokas says today, that the end result is West Virginia, in fact, is the winner. So Gail Catlett's club uh, on the year now is 5-5 five and 1-1 five and one and one in the league. St. Joe's is 4-6 and 0-2 and oh in the Atlantic 10. Bad news for the Washington Huskies. The school announced that starting guard uh, Gary Gardner has been ruled academically ineligible today, and he's been dropped from the school. The 6'3 junior started all 12 Husky games, was averaging just about four points per game. Don't forget, Bob Lee and Dick Vitale will be by right after this ESPN Sports Center with the first edition of the new year of College Basketball Report. They'll be taking a look at Walt Hazard, the UCLA coach, among other things. And don't forget, right after that, it'll be St. John's against Villanova, our initial Big East game of 1985. That will be Big East basketball all season long on ESPN. Let's check out ESPN's Top 20 now, and when we return, there's hockey and more football news. We know how much you love sports. So what would it take to get you to pick up the phone and order Sports Illustrated? A free trip to the World Series? Sorry. How about a discount when you subscribe? Say, 10% off? 25? 35%? How about almost 50% off the cover price? That's a savings of nearly a dollar on every issue. And you fast break into basketball right through the NBA playoffs. Plus, coverage of hockey, baseball, and football. No one captures the spirit of the game better than Sports Illustrated. So why aren't you dialing? All right. What if we also include Sports Illustrated's 1985 baseball preview issue with profiles, feature stories, and predictions for every division, every team? More? How about our famous swimsuit issue that covers one of the most exciting spectator sports under the sun? Not enough? Well, are you a baseball fan? We'll take you from spring training to the heat of the pennant races. More? Okay, we'll even give you this free 1985 baseball schedule for every major league team. So, how about a final bonus? This exclusive Sports Illustrated AM-FM sound set. It's your personal hi-fi complete with headphones. So why aren't you pressing those pretty little buttons? Oh, the phone number. It's 1-800-221-3200. 30 issues of Sports Illustrated for three easy monthly installments of just $9.89. That's almost half off the cover price. 
including the baseball preview and the swimsuit issue, plus this 1985 baseball schedule and AMFM personal hi-fi, free with your paid subscription. So now what? I can't see the phone number. It's 1-800-221-3200. Call now. Chico Resch and the New Jersey Generals were fuming last night, and for good reason, after losing 5-4 in overtime to the New York Rangers, they didn't think they should ever have gotten to overtime. They thought they should have won it in regulation. We'll pick this game up in the third period. On an icing call, Jan Ludwig beats Timmy Richmond to the puck, feeds Paul Gagne, who beats Hanlon between the pads, 4-3 Devils. Controversy struck 40 seconds later. Watch the slow-mo. Robbie Petoric backhander deflects. Off Resch hits the crossbar. Look, it never crosses the line into the goal. The referee Brian Lewis rules it a goal. Resch, a little bit upset. The goal judge says, hey, I never pushed the button. Well, what do you want from me? Anyways, we're tied 4-4, four to four, so we go to overtime. And what happens in overtime? You guessed it. Thomas Sandstrom beats Glenn Resch with the short shot off the faceoff. Devils coach Doug Carpenter gets his yells in before this one is over, though. Gives Lewis a piece of his mind. The Rangers win it 5-4 in OT. Let's take a look at the schedule in the National Hockey League. This is the way it shapes up this evening in NHL activity. First of all, the Los Angeles Kings are on the road at Boston to play the Bruins. The Toronto Maple Leafs are home to host Hartford. That's tonight's action in the NHL. By the time this 1984 National Football League season is wrapped and stored away, Miami Dolphins quarterback Dan Marino may be the most awarded player in any single season in NFL history. Marino's stats for the regular season are impressive, to say the least. His 48 touchdown passes and his 5,000-plus yards passing now stand as NFL records. Marino was in New York today to accept the NFL Most Valuable Player Award handed down by the professional football writers. Consider, too, that Marino had nine games in which he passed for more than three.